we have been studying the last couple of weeks. I, you know, I told you I didn't really mean to study on the seven churches of Asia, but it kind of came about that way, following in with our study of uh, failures are not fatal, failures in our ministry, failures in our Christian walk are not fatal. All we have to do is make that 180, repent, and move on with God. And, and those failures that we have in life are not fa fatal. They do not have to be the end of your ministry. If you have fallen, get up. Get right with God and get on with it. And then it's the last two weeks we've been looking at churches who have had their failures, had their faults, had their struggles, had their problems. But in all seven of these churches, there were promises given to overcomers, which tells me that the failures of each of these churches it were not, it was not going to be fatal to them as a whole. If they would do the things he said for them to do, they would be overcomers among them. The very fact that he wrote the scripture to each one, to, to the overcomer, I will grant, I will give, I will do this, I will do that. That's prophecy that there would be overcomers. That these seven churches, they, they all had some, well, most of them had some good things about them. Uh, he reprimanded them for their failures and their the sins in their churches, but then he also promised to the overcomer. So that their church, just because it faltered and it struggled, didn't have to stay that way. It would, there would be some overcomers because he said there is a promise to the overcomers. We looked at, um, two weeks ago, we looked at Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos. And uh, then last week we looked at Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. And uh, I told you, you probably never heard these seven churches talk exactly this way. I certainly never had. And uh, mean no disrespect to the Word of God, but uh, in our lesson, we, we did, dubbed the Ephesus church as the church of the has-beens. They were banking on all their prior religious, spiritual experiences to get them through. They were a church of traditions and programs. The church at Smyrna was a missionary church, but it kind of had this attitude, poor, pitiful me. Poor pitiful man, I don't have anything. Just, uh, just a little small missionary church. Christ had to remind them that they were rich. Even though they thought they had nothing, he reminded them that they were rich. The church at Pergamos, I kind of dubbed that church the anything goes church because they just allowed everything to go on. They were like politically correct. They were tolerant of this one and that one and the other regardless of whether there was any truth in their ministry. The church at Thyatira, we spent a pretty good time talking about them, called them the church of the control freak because they tolerated the person being in control and, and dominating and that controlling spirit. Uh, the scripture refers to as the prophetess Jezebel. They, the majority of them tolerated this, followed this, bought into it. I told you this was much like our modern cults that we see. That's how they manage to gather their flock is by control. They, they strip them of everything that they have of their own, and they control them. You know, sometimes even brainwashing them is, is what, things we have heard about them. So that's the church at Thyatira. We talked about Sardis. And we, we spent a little time with Sardis last week, and we said that was the church that had the form of godliness, but denied the power. They were the denominational churches, the churches with the name. I'm a so-and-so, I'm a this, I'm a that, but they didn't have any power of God in their church. Then we looked at the church of Philadelphia as a loyal, testimony-keeping church. Very spiritual, very in earnest, but uh, they were weak. They had little strength. I kind of called them the little church in the Dale because, you know, they, had, they were doing a good thing. They just weren't growing. They weren't reaching out. They weren't doing anything extra. He said, I know you're a good church and you're loyal and you're trustworthy. He said, but you have just a little strength. So... We looked at them a little bit last, last week. And uh, we left the church at Laodicea for tonight. Uh, and then the more I got to looking at it, I thought, well, that's good. We'll have a whole service for that. Probably could spend three or four on that church because the church at Laodicea was a wild and worldly and a, what they call a free kind of church. Oh, just come as you are. That's all right. And that's a good invitation, come as you are. But when you get here, you're supposed to meet Jesus, have an encounter and change and turn from your wickedness and do something different. But the church at Laodicea said, just come on as you are, do what you want to, be what you want to be, it'll be all right. 
it's all right. It, you know, you want to you wanna do this, that's all right. You want to do that, that's all right. You want to come today and not come for three weeks, that's all right. That's the church of Laodicea. They were just like easy and free. Just kind of come and go, church, you know, just... You know, one Sunday, one Sunday they might have had a thousand, and the next Sunday they might have had twenty. You know, one Sunday they might have had church in the sanctuary, and the next Sunday they might have all went to the river and went fishing and called it church. You know, they was just one of them free, popular, worldly kind of churches. And uh, I could think of a few I wanted to name, but I won't. Uh, but I kind of dubbed this church, you know, that uh, free church. You know, just free, just whatever. I pray. Have you ever seen some of those folks that have gone from a, a very strict lifestyle to a lifestyle where they say, I'm free? Mm -hmm. Those that, as Paul would say, use their liberty as a license to sin. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's the church that they ought to see. Yeah. You know, they say, oh, well, we got Jesus. We're free. We, we, it's all right for do this and do this and do this. It's all right. Well, a look at the city tells me that Laodicea was a rich city. It was very wealthy. Very well to do, had a large population of very influential Jewish people there in that city. Uh, it was a wealthy trade center for all the cities in that area. It was uh, also a communication center for, for that area. All the major, you'd say like the mail went through there. Mm -hmm. It was a communication center. Um, they had a school of medicine that, uh, there was nothing around that was anything like this school of medicine that was at Laodicea. And they were real proud of it, you know. It, they, uh, they had developed something they called a Phygean powder or an eye salve that was supposed to bring healing to blind eyes. They had developed some uh, cures for ear ail ailments. Uh, you know, they, they just had all kinds of things going for them. They are also noted for uh, this uh, black glossy wool <coughs> that they uh, had there in Laodicea that they exported everywhere, and that was part of their wealth. You see, they had all these good things going as far as the world is concerned. But somewhere along the way in all of that wealth and all that prosperity, they were kind of missing out on the truth. Right. You know, there were a few people there that worshipped Jesus, worshipped Christianity, worshipped God. There was others, though, that worshipped Zeus. Right. And then there was other gods. Just, you know, that was a thing there. You know, they had idols of every kind. Yeah, I don't know anybody around here really that has like these statues and stuff in their yard and all this that they go out and burn incense to. I don't really know anybody like that. <clears throat> but I know lots of people that have idols in their life. Right. Things that they take more time with than they do with God. Right. You know, so it's all the same difference. But that's the city of Laodicea. They were wealthy, they were rich by the world standards, materialism. Yep. They had everything going for them except their water was not fit to drink. It came to them through a six mile aqueduct from a city uh, south of there. And you would think with all their wealth, all their knowledge, all the money they had, all, you know, you'd think they'd come up with some kind of way to have some decent water. But their water was not very good. Their lifeline can't live without water. This is a very uh, physical thing we're looking at, you know, that their water was bad. It, you know, it just barely sustained what they needed to do and barely taste, barely want to drink it or anything like that. It was their lifeline. And really, it just parallels right on into the spiritual realm. They thought they had everything. Christianity, and they had Zeus, and they had... Uh, Artemis and they had da da da. They thought they had all the spiritual things they could have, but their lifeline, Jesus Christ, they didn't even have him. They didn't really have a lifeline that was clean and pure and refreshing. You know, they, and they didn't even have sense enough to know that. That's the rebuke we see. Let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3. We'll pick up in verse 14. And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, to him write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Oh, here's that phrase again. I know your works. You are neither hot or cold, and I wish that you was one or the other. Praise the Lord. Wish you was one or the other. But I know exactly how you are. Now I've heard that particular scripture 
preached every kind of way in the world, hot or cold. And I could give you some of those illustrations that I have heard. But this is what God impressed on me and I wrote down. You're not zealous to do what I want you to do. You're not hot, you're not zealous, you're not working, but you're not completely buried yet. You're not cold and buried and dead. It's just enough of you to be causing trouble, to be useless in my kingdom. Praise the Lord. You know, because if the church itself was so cold that it was buried and gone, there'd be room there for a resurrection. There'd be room there for somebody to come in and start a new work for the Lord there. But there was just enough of it there to have a little presence. Just enough to be present but not do anything. Useless. There's lots of churches like that too. You know, they got, they got a great old big building. They may have a crowd on Sunday morning. You look for them for a Tuesday night prayer meeting and there's a pastor and one or two of his deacons. Maybe one little Sunday school teacher that's trying real hard to come to prayer meeting. Wednesday night, well, there'll be a whole pile of kids come for midweek. But you now, if you're going to have a two-week revival, uh -uh, it won't happen. You know, not, not zealous enough to just keep doing the work of God, but not totally dead so you can close the doors and move on. That's the church at Laodicea. You remember last week I, I talked to you a little bit about Christ's introduction of himself. To every one of these churches, Christ was introduced. And in this letter to the Laodiceans, he introduces himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. Praise the Lord. All three of these things are going to address the problems that they had. We talked about this a little with the other churches, that his introduction of himself was telling them the things that he was going to do for them, the things that he would stand for in their church. You know, their, their largest problem there in Laodicea, though, it was that they were self-deceived. They couldn't see the shape that they were in. How do I know that? He says, so you are lukewarm. You're neither cold or hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, and I don't need anything. Oh, see, that, that's their picture of themselves. As a church, they said, oh, we got plenty of money. We got all the instruments we need. We got musicians. We got programs. We got everything we need. Money just rolling in. You know, we, we got it all. We're fine. We don't need anything else. You know, that, that to me is one of the pictures of one of them churches that has got everything detailed down the line to the fact that they don't even need the Holy Ghost to interrupt their service. There's a lot of them like that. And then it just lined up, and you let the spirit begin to move a little bit, and they just plunge on down through their program because they don't need that. That's Laodicea Church. They said, we got everything we need. What do we need with a, a message in tongues and an interpretation? What do we need with somebody speaking a word of prophecy or exhortation? That's not in the bulletin for today's service. I know this is kind of hard, but I, this is... The Laodicean church. And this is the church at large, really. If you look at the church world at large, it's pretty much that way. They say, we got everything we need. We got our girls' clubs, our boys' clubs. We got the women's meetings. We got the men's meetings. We got something going for our youth. What do we need with any special fasting and praying? What do you mean you want me to fast and pray? We don't need all that. We got everything we need. That's the church at Laodicea. We're rich. We don't need anything. But Christ in his introduction says, I'm the faithful and true witness, which means I discern the truth about you. I will tell you the truth about yourself. And here he says, you do not know that you are wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. And you're naked. Okay, what were some of those things the city was noted for? School of Medicine, famous eyesight. They had what it took to cure blindness. Christ says you're blind. What they had, they had famous black glossy wool that you could make anything out of. Certainly, I'm sure they had lots of clothes made out of that. He said, you're naked. 
you're just naked. He said, you're miserable and you're wretched. And I, the more I thought about that, I thought, ooh, that is a sad condition. I mean, I hadn't even heard anybody use the word wretch or wretched except like in a sermon or something a long time. But uh, if you think, of, think back a few years, people did use words like that. And if they said something was wretched, I mean, they meant like it was filthy, stinky, nasty, don't get near me. It's pretty much what that word wretched means. Rank. Raunchy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, pastor got some words for what that wretched means. How would you like that today if, if Christ stood before us and looked at us as a church and said, you're wretched. You stink. I don't even want to be around you. That's what he was saying to the church at Laodicea. They were wretched. He said, you can't even see it. That's your biggest problem. You can't even see this. And you've got all this material stuff, but spiritually, you're broke. You're bankrupt. You don't have anything. You don't have nothing to offer even if you wanted to. You're bankrupt. You're miserable and you're poor. You know, sometimes people that are miserable will do everything under the sun to get away from that misery. That's when they will go live in the high light. That's when they'll go run up their credit cards to the max, having a good time when they're miserable, trying to get away from it. That's the church at Laodicea. The church as a whole was going wild, trying to make up for what they didn't have in the spirit realm. I'm telling you, I've never heard, well, I heard this this way, but it's the way that the Lord was showing it to me. And, you know, I, I, there's a lot more here, I'm sure, than what we even can figure out. But he says to the church now, you just think you got everything. I counsel thee. Now, here is what Christ says to the church. It is in this pitiful, poor, wretched condition. He said, I want you to buy of me. We're going to talk about this buy in a minute. I want you to buy of me gold. That's their materialism. That's their wealth. But he's telling them, I want you to get it from me. I want you to find some spiritual wealth. Gold tried in the fire. That you will be rich. I want you to buy from me white raiment. Not this glossy black wool that they're so famous for. But some white raiment. Which we know symbolizes righteous living. A robe of righteousness. He didn't say he was giving it to them. He said, I counsel you to buy it of me. If he gives you something to you, it don't cost you anything, right? If you go buy something, there's a cost involved. And I never really had grasped this in this passage of Scripture until just recently. He said, also, I want you to buy this white raiment that you will be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And I also want you to anoint your eyes with eye salve. Again, it's indicating that he wants us to, wants the Laodicean church to buy this from him. Eyes with eye salve that you may see. He's saying, I want to fix these problems that you have. I want, to I want you to be spiritually rich. I want you to be able to see the things in the spirit realm that you need in your life. I want you to be clothed in righteousness. But he didn't say he was going to give it to them. And I just, I broke down and just cried the more I read this and more I read this and more I read this because I've heard it. I've heard this scripture all my life and never thought much about it. Have you ever thought much about it? He says, I counsel you to buy it of me. Praise the Lord. And the scripture I first thought about was over in Isaiah when he says, come and buy those without money, come and buy. You know, that's on another side of the coin. Here he says, come and buy these things, gold tried in the fire, Robes of righteousness that you may be clothed and cover the shame of your nakedness. I want you to buy eye salve that you may see. He says, because as many as I love, I rebuke, I chasten. He's telling them this because he loves them. Mm -hmm. Chasten means he disciplines. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I wrote it down. <clears throat> the things that you once had spiritually. The things that you once had. The gifts you once received from Christ. See, we're talking about a church originally founded on Christian principles, perhaps even founded by Epaphras. Uh, in Colossians chapter 4, it talks about Epaphras having a love for the Laodiceans. So it's possible he founded the church there. 
We're talking about a church that was founded on Christian principles, a church that had received the gift of salvation. Okay? And we know the gifts of the Holy Spirit were taught in Corinthians, so I feel sure they were given those gifts in the church of Laodicea. Well, I wrote this down. is the things that you once had, those gifts that I once gave you early in your Christian walk that you have now lost by the wayside, that you've laid down and let go in the place of idols, that you have let go in your wealth and materialism, those things that you have laid by the wayside, now in order to get them back, you must purchase them or buy them with discipleship. Uh, it, now to me it's a very heavy thing and, and, and a lot of people will say, well no, you don't have to buy those things, God gives. And he does. The gift of salvation is a free gift. But it costs. It costs you living your life. It costs him everything. But I can tell you from experience, if you ever walk with the Lord and then you kind of get away from him, you know what that expression is, you know, if you feel far away from the Lord, guess who moved? You know, because we drift away. If you've ever been at that place where you've backslidden on God, I'll just go ahead and use that Pentecostal word there. And you've backslid on God. The road backs hard. And it ain't just handed to you. Those bondages that were broken an instant, sometimes they're not broken the second time around. Sometimes it takes a little more effort to overcome. And I believe that's what he's saying to Laodicea. You had all these things, and then you got puffed up in your pride and your materialism and your richness and your school of medicine. You didn't need God to heal you. You had your school of medicine to take care of all that. He said, now you're going to have to purchase with discipleship. You're going to have to purchase these things from me. You're going to have to purchase robes of righteousness. Gold tried in the fire. What, what do we know about gold tried in the fire? What does he say? Our trials are like the refiner's fire to purify us. That's what he's saying here. You know, you, you've been living high on the hog as a church. They ought to say you've been living good. And just, you think just fine. It's going to cost you some persecution, some trials. Some, it's going to take you becoming a disciple again. Because I love you and I rebuke you and I chasten you. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then another very familiar voice here. Uh, scripture here, 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. <coughs> and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Praise the Lord. He's making some promises here if they will just make that effort to let him in. See, the church at Laodicea had gotten so busy and so puffed up and so doing their own thing that they had closed the door on Christ. We have no need of anything. He said, but I'm patiently waiting. You know what happens at my house when I hear on the door at my house? Most of the time I roll on over and go on back to sleep. Because I'm sleeping good. I don't want to be bothered. And that little knock will be a little bit harder. And I think, hmm, that might be important. <laughs> well, you know. And if Dale's at home, I'll say, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, I have been known to say, just be quiet. Don't get up. They'll go away. Y'all are laughing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Pretend when that gets to me. Somebody's got to get up and open the door. And most likely, there's somebody telling you your house is on fire. You know? I'm really good. That's what he said here. I'm waiting patiently. I've just been just standing here, just waiting, just knocking on your door. But I'm knocking a little bit louder now because I see you for who you are and I know what you need. I know your works. He's out there at the door saying, I know your works. You need to do something about your life. 
Church, you got to wake up. you got to do something different. You need to put on robes of righteousness, and you need to repent. Hallelujah. And the church is saying, leave me alone. I'm all right. I'm just resting a little while. I'm taking a little vacation from church. I'm tired of teaching Sunday school all the time. I'm tired of going to church all the time. I'm tired of Pastor Love wanting me to do one more thing. I'm just making an example, Pastor. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying here. They had gotten to the place where they decided they didn't need God. And he's saying, but I'm knocking. All you got to do is open the door. All you got to do is open the door. He said, if you hear my voice, open the door. And he says, I'll come in. All he wanted the church to do was give him an opening to have his way. That's all he wanted. He didn't tell them they had to jump through 15 hoops to get him to do something. He just said, open the door, and I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. What did I tell you about their water? Wasn't fit to drink. What do we know about Jesus? John chapter 4, he's talking to the woman at the well. He says, uh, I'll give you a drink of water. You won't ever thirst again. Hallelujah. I'll give you a drink of water, rivers of living water. Hallelujah. He's telling them, here, if you just open the door for me, I'll give you something good to drink. Amen. You won't have to ever worry about having bad water again. You know, I know I'm jumping from the natural to the spiritual, but that's what he's talking to here. Hallelujah. But he used those natural things for them to understand. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we just can't grasp it all if it's out here in the spirit realm. A lot of times he's going to bring it down to, to something natural, right where we live. That's why he spoke in parables when he taught with the disciples. Because that was something they understood. They could make the, the comparison. Those rivers of living water. What else? I'll suck with him. He with me. That means he's going to come in and spend some time with you. Glory. You know, now, uh, eating with the family is a forgotten art these days. People sitting down together and sharing a meal as a family. It's kind of a forgotten thing. But it, I, can, I can remember when it was an important thing in my household growing up for us to sit down at the table and have supper together. Daddy would come in from work, mom would have to fix supper, we'd be in from school, get our homework, and we'd sit down together. How was your day? Well, what happened to you? What's wrong? You know, everything good? Got something going on this week at school? You know, just conversation, fellowship, time of sharing. You know, it's so foreign to us today, it's hard to even relate to that concept. But in that day, he was telling them, look, I will fellowship with you again. I'll bring you living water that is good for you, that will bring you to eternal life, that will cause a spring of living water. Not stagnant water that's got to come six miles up an aqueduct. Not, you don't have to read last week's newsletter. You don't have to be reading... Uh, accounts of miracles from 25 years ago, I'm going to bring you some new and living water. And what is, if he's in there supping with him, that means he's having supper with him, or he's eating with him, drinking with him. Also in John chapter 4 and verse 34, the disciples said something about eating, and he said what? I have bread that you know not of. Hallelujah. I have food that you don't know anything about. Hallelujah. Another passage, he said, I am <coughs> the bread of life. So in his invitation to the Laodiceans to open the door, he was saying, I'm going to bring you something good to eat. I'm going to bring you cool, clear, refreshing spiritual water that you'll never thirst again. All you got to do is open the door. <coughs> again, the promise to the overcomer. You know, I told you, every one of these churches had their failures. They had their faults. But there must have been overcomers or he wouldn't have promised anything to them. Had to be. Just like there's overcomers today. You know, anywhere along the way in our studies these last three Wednesday nights, if you found yourself, you can be an overcomer because he's promised you can. And he's promised what he'll give you. Here in verse 21, he said, To him that I that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. You can come on up here where I live. You can sit right down here with me. Even as I also overcame... And I have sit down with my father in his throne. All you got to do is overcome. And you'll be a joint heir with me again. 
That's what he's saying. Just because I told you you was wretched, miserable, blind, and poor, don't mean you have to stay that way. He's saying if you will overcome, become zealous and repent in verse 19, then I will grant for you to be enthroned with me in my heavenly kingdom. You know, that seemed to be really important to them. You can sit down with me, with my Father and his throne. And again, he said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I believe, believe we brought this out last week, or maybe in the beginning session, that the letter to every church ended that way. And so I believe, because he says what the Spirit says to the church is, that even though each of these seven letters was addressed individually to a church, I believe that each of those seven churches had opportunity to read these letters or to hear this information, to hear what the Spirit had to say. And it wasn't just the seven churches of Asia. It's been the churches all down through time. You know, I believe as we have shared these last three weeks, we have been hearing what the Spirit has got to say to the church today, to our church the church down the street, to the church down the street, boy, they're about 14 on Campbell Street alone. And his spirit is speaking today. And whether anybody ever hears what we got to say about it here, it's in this book. And it was recorded and kept for us as instruction. Well, we read that last week too, for instruction, reproof, correction, inspired by God. Again, going back to Christ's introduction to the church of Laodicea, he says, besides being the true and faithful witness, besides exposing you, he said, I am the beginning of the creation of God. To me, that tells me why he can redo them. He can remake them. He can remold them because he was in the beginning with God. He made things. He was the Word of God. It was John 1, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He's telling them, look, I'm where it's at. And I have the power to rule. I have the power to make the difference. And the, the very first thing he said is, I am the amen. And different people say different things about what the amen means. But uh, I've always heard amen means so be it. That's the way it is. When we say amen in church, we're like, that's right. He said to the church at Laodicea, I'm what's right. What I said is goes. So I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. He's the standard. He's the ruler over all. He's the source of all power and all truth. It's just really exciting to me to know that we have promises to be overcomers. If these churches that we looked at can be so messed up, so messed up. Ephesus spent all their time talking about what they used to have, what they used to do, and all the uh, crusades they used to have. And, well, I used to teach Sunday school, and I used to go soul winning, and I used to go knocking on, I used to go on missionary trips. They were messed up. They were living in the past. But he said to him that overcomes, I'm going to give heavenly food. I'm going to give the tree of life. You can come to the paradise of God. Church at Smyrna, Oh, he didn't say anything too bad to them. He didn't have a reproof for them because they were a pretty good little church. They had endured lots of hardships and trials, but he did have to remind them that they were rich. They didn't need to be having a little pity party. How many times have we been in that church at Smyrna? I'm the only one in my family trying to do right. I just don't know how much longer I can hold out. Or that little saint that testifies. Just pray that I hold on to the end. That's the church at Smyrna. But he promised to him that overcomes to the church at Smyrna, I'll give you a crown of life. And the second death will have no hold on you. The church at Pergamos, oh man, it, it, it was steadfast in the midst of all their evils. In the midst of all this corruption. They were steadfast to a certain extent. But yet... They were just, anything goes. How many times are we like that? We're steadfast if somebody gets on our little pet doctor, man, we can tell them exactly how it goes. But then we can be easily swayed by somebody else that says they know something. Mm -hmm. But he said to the overcomers in the church of Pergamos, I'll give you the hidden blessings. I'll give you divine food. I'll give you a new name. 
and I'll give you that white stone. And we talked about that quite a bit, you know, how that was a clean slate, a pardon. I can change things. I can turn things around for you. I can give you a new name, make things different. The church at Thyatira, now they were really messed up. They were so far spiritually gone that they did whatever the leader said do. Oh, sometimes we're like that. We just get in our own little world and we just do what, just do what the next one's doing. Just follow the leader. Just go to church on Sunday and on Wednesday because that's what we're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? But to the church at Thyatira, to him that overcomes, I'll give spiritual illumination. I'll show you the greater things of my kingdom. And I will give you dominion over all and authority over nations. And I will be your morning star. To the church at Sardis, he said, you have a form of godliness, but you don't have any power. <clears throat> How many individuals do you know? I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And they can't even pray a headache away. That's right. Well, that's right the Lord. You know, I can bring it on down. How many times have I sit with a headache and said, oh, we stay out of town and all. You know what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. That was them. But he said, to those that overcome from the church of Sardis, I'll give you a rope of righteousness. I'll make you a citizen in the heavenly kingdom. Hallelujah. You will have a pure relationship with Christ and eternal life. Glory. To the church of Philadelphia, that's loyal. Now this is what I like to think that I am, you know, loyal, holding to the testimony of the Lord, just doing all I can for the Lord. Just a good little church. Just a good little church. But he said, you're weak. You're of little strength. You're not reaching out. You're not doing all that you can do. I, that probably fits a lot of us tonight. Hmm. And in the church we've talked about tonight, they ought to see it. No conscience, conceited, self-deceived, spiritually bankrupt, blind, and wretched. I did that entertainment tonight. I don't know why exactly. Maybe that's why, maybe those folks were more entertainment, interested in entertainment than they were going to church. Uh, we're missing a few tonight. Oh, wait, it's not Monday. Anyway, you know, well, if it was Monday night revival, I'd tell you there'd be plenty of watching some entertainment, some sports or something, you know. Preached for a long time on that, couldn't you? Anyway. But to the overcomer of Laodicea, he said, you can fellowship with me all the time. You can come and sit with me at the right hand of the Father and fellowship and reign in heaven. We got, do we have hang-ups as Christian people? Do we have hang-ups? Do we have problems? Do we falter? Do we fail sometimes? Does North Jackson have problems occasionally? Does North Jackson fail occasionally somewhere along the way? Uh, or we can just go to the past and say, yeah, we have in the past. We want to. But he's promised we can be overcomers. Right. Praise the Lord. No matter which one of these churches that you identified as an individual that you are most like, or no matter which one of these churches you think our church is uh, most like, or... Maybe you saw a little bit of each of these in your church or in your life. He's promised you can overcome these things. And basically his call to the, to the churches, really, actually if you look at it real close, it was the same for all seven churches. He said, open your eyes. See your condition. Put on a robe of righteousness. Take up your cross and follow me. And that's the same call he has for us today. Amen. To open our eyes spiritually and see, see the things in us that we need to change. Amen. Put on a robe of righteousness. That means change those things. Amen. That's what it means. Change those things. And then bear your cross daily. That's what he wants of us as a church collectively. It's not all Pastor Love's job to carry this church. It's not just his job and two more to go out and do all the outreach. It's not their job, just, you know. It's, every, it's As a body, it's all of our responsibility as a unit. For each of these churches, he talked to them as a body. He said, to the church at Laodicea, to the church at Sardis, 
to the church at Philadelphia. He didn't say to the pastor of the church at Sardis. Now you got to get your people lined out. He didn't say that. He said to the church. To me, that indicates that as a body, each one of us tonight are responsible to the other for helping along this journey. Each one of us are responsible to help the other in carrying on the work of this church. Each of us are responsible for sharing the word of God and reaching out. Each one of us are responsible, and each one of us can be overcomers. You know, and if the church was totally full of overcomers, what would happen? I don't think it would I don't think it ever be totally full of overcomers because there's still people to reach. But we'd have more outreach programs than we would have classes. Because we'd be if everybody was an overcomer, we'd all be zealous to get more folks in. That's what really lets me know that we're not all overcomers in every one of these areas. You know, I feel like I'm an overcomer in a lot of things. But there's some things yet that I haven't Still not up to the plate. Some things yet that I'm still not doing. All I can do. And he's saying to him that overcomes. This, 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 and this. And that's what I want to challenge you tonight as a church. I want our church to be an overcoming church. To overcome trials and hardships and failures. To overcome when the times are rough. To overcome when people talk about us. Not lower ourselves to their level, but to overcome. As individuals, I want us to overcome these things. I want us to overcome materialism. I want us to overcome spirit of control. I want us to overcome a spirit of laziness. I want us to overcome this indifference. You know, I want us to overcome all these things that these churches needed to overcome. I want us to as a church. And I just thank him because we have a promise that we can. We have a promise that we can. See, so many people te teach and preach a gospel that, that you just, you're just nothing. And you ain't never going to be nothing. And you're just going to struggle along in this life. And the best you can do is hold on. There's lots of people like that. My Bible says we can be overcomers. What did he say? I have overcome the world. What did he say just before that? He said, be of good cheer, little children. I have overcome the world. Then he said what? You all know the scripture. Greater, say it with me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's what the word says. Hallelujah. Y'all stand up. And you know, I, you never know what I'm